All right. Okay. I don't think I introduced myself, did I? I maybe I did, but anyway. You did, but that's okay. You can I'll do introduce it again. myself again. Rennie Gower, Professor Emerita from Virginia Commonwealth University. I'm also the chief curator for um, Wiley Contemporary Inc. And it's my distinct pleasure to interview Virginia Derryberry, an amazing artist. She's a figurative painter, an educator, a colleague, and a friend. So over the years, Virginia has received many accolades and awards that include CCAC's um, Award for Outstanding Artistic Achievement, CAA's Distinguished Teaching Award, and she's been a visiting artist appointment at the American Academy in Rome two times, so excellent. She's exhibited her artwork from coast to coast and has had a solo exhibition currently on view at MOCA in Jacksonville, Florida. We first met over 20 years ago, and at that time we were both seasoned educators who wanted to move our careers forward with more museum shows and catalog publications. So along with three other artists, we kind of pooled our resources and made that happen through a nationally traveling exhibition and publication. Since then, I have really come to rely on Virginia's wisdom, her positive outlook, and her generosity. And so I continue to look ways, for ways to, to collaborate with her. All right, so I'm going to start with this big question. She, um, Virginia, you paint monumental paintings, evidence there on the screen, and family members and former students are often um, your models. Um, you depict them in historical or mythical or heroic contexts. They're very luminous in color and they quickly seduce the viewer. By contrast, you embed these um, visual clues, fruit, alchemical objects, boats, weapons, animals, and that reveals a darker, more melancholic sort of subtext and meaning. And when the men are, predict are pre uh, depicted in your paintings, they're usually in a supportive role to the women. This is a bit of an outlier that it's all fellas, but um, the women always radiate power and grace. And so after that, my question really is, are your narratives autobiographical? Okay. So I've been doing these large-scale figure narrative paintings for the last 15 years or so. Prior to that, more abstractionist landscape. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Everybody's all right? Yeah. Um, I also wanted to say what an honor it is to be here with so many amazing women. In this room, on the panel, it's great to be here and have these kinds of conversations. Okay. Um, I was doing these figure narrative paintings for, um, like I said, 15 years or so, and about five years ago, someone said to me, you know, Virginia, the figures in your paintings seem to be getting larger and larger, almost like they're going to pop off the canvas. What is that? What is that about? Why are you doing that? And so I realized that in some way I was almost doing something like gaming and creating avatars of myself and my environment and my world, directly or indirectly. So that's the maybe autobiographical component, that sense that when I'm making a big painting, and they're usually very big, much bigger than I am, I'm making an environment that I feel like I can walk into and build as I'm painting. And it changes step by step. I don't always have a, a total game plan it looks like I do, but I don't. It really changes. So I'm making that environment that I can walk into, that I can be a part of, and that hopefully my viewers can feel like they can walk into as well. Right? They're the audience, but they're also the participant, as I am. Um, as far as the, the objects and other forms are concerned, I'm also interested in alchemy, which is the forerunner of modern science. A number of artists and inventors have been uh, interested in that. Alchemy is the science of, of trying to, to make gold from lead. You can't do it. <laughs> okay, you can't do it. Just like with art, you have a game plan, but it's not a formula, right? The experimentation, the process is the part that we love. And to me, that connects to the idea of avatars and gaming as well that things evolve in the process of making. So many of these objects reference alchemy either directly or indirectly, but also address the idea of high contrast, 
duality, things not being resolved. They look real initially, but the more you look at them, the more you realize that they can't be real. Like all of these guys, they didn't pose together. I did drawings, I took photos, I comprised them in my own way. They weren't in that particular surrounding. That's my backyard, that house behind my house. So they're autobiographical elements, but also this game playing that's going on. That's what keeps me rolling as an artist. Well, the objects also um, refer back to the Vanitas um, narratives. Do you want to expand yeah. on that just a little bit? Yeah, I, I think a lot of people know what Vanitas, V-A-N-I-T-A-S, means. But, but if you don't, um, those are paintings that were done primarily 16th, 17th century um, a Dutch artists who wanted to portray um, a culture of plenty, amplitude, but also to warn about um, that death was coming sooner or later. So Vanitas is living the fullness of life, like ripe fruit, candles that are burning in a still life image, but also the inevitability of death fruits that are also maybe rotten in the same painting, or candles that have been snuffed out, or glass that's been broken. So it's a metaphorical way of symbolizing, again, that duality, which the alchemists also loved, right, too. Right. Yeah, so. yeah. So you also create um, smaller mixed media hybrids that combine parts of earlier paintings, um, often with textiles, often with found objects, and embroidery and other decorative embellishments. Yeah. Um, more intimate in scale than these paintings, um, these works also are allegorical. Um, while they reference women's handicrafts, quilts, and handwork, needle point samplers as, as such. So especially with these pieces in mind, um, has your career or artwork been affected by changes in art world trends or even um, by real world politics? Both, <laughs> I think. Um, in terms of the use of textiles and fabric in conjunction with my paintings. And you, can, you can go on my website and see more examples of that. Obviously, there's no fabric and textile in this particular piece, um, although there's some connections. But I have gotten interested in the connection between textiles and painting, for example, um, in the sense of materiality first, right? The build up, the surface, the texture of paint is seductive. It's seductive to do, it's seductive to look at. Um, and the same thing with fabric and textiles. You want to touch them for the most part. There is that. There's also the seductiveness of color. And again, that's one reason that I became a painter. But fabric has that component as well. Um, the other connection is that, you know, even though I guess I said my paintings look real-ish, I'm also interested in the flatness and patterning of color. So on one level, you can get back and feel like you're maybe looking through a window into a deeper space. But the closer you get to the painting, the more you see the patterning, right? And the areas that are thick paint versus thin paint. And you can't tell that in a reproduction. It's really tough. But if you're there in the presence of the painting, you can see that happening. And that's what attracts me. And I think it has, uh, for a lot of artists in the recent past, like five to seven years, a number of painters as well as sculptors as well as other artists have combined textiles with the work that they do, either on the wall or three-dimensionally or whatever. And that just fascinates me, that idea. And in addition to that, my family history has a lot to do with, with textiles and fabric. My grandmother sewed all the clothes for all four of her children until they went to college. Amazing. My great aunt was a hat maker during the 1930s that she just had to make a living during the Depression, so she designed and made hats. Um, and I also have ancestors who did crazy quilts. I don't know if you all know what crazy quilts are. They don't really have a set pattern. It's almost squares and areas that are designed individually by women in a group that put it together. And sometimes they are truly funky. Yes. Very Amazing. Funny. They have autobiographical elements as well. Um, as well as really fancy stitching and all of that. And so all, thing, all of those things combined with that sense of, again, another conversation between material textiles and materiality of paint has really informed a lot of what I've done over the last, uh, last number of years. So 
one other component when you, when you bring that up, what interests me about both textiles and, and painting is that I mentioned earlier that um, I think of patterning as being really interesting. So as I'm making these things, both these and the hybrid pieces, um, in a way I feel like I'm putting pieces back together again. And that collaborating references... Collaborating with yourself. Collaborating with myself, <laughs> but also referencing wider culture. We live in a really broken time, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm not directly fixing things, but the process of making feels like I am bringing greater wholeness into being, not just for myself, but for my audience. And I hope that they feel that, too. One other piecing together component, and you can see it in this painting. These are actually um, four separate canvases, right? And in the last, again, three or four years, I've been doing that more and more often. And I try, again, this game I play it keeps me excited and moving. I try to make each individual section stand on its own, compositionally, color-wise, but also together. So that's another way of kind of putting the pieces together. Um, sometimes I use odd shapes like this. Sometimes they're more straightforward rectangles and squares. Sometimes there are many, many, many pieces. Sometimes just a few. I don't do that in every one, but it, again, keeps me going, keeps me thinking about what I'm going to do next. Right. Yeah. So sort of proceeding with this, <clears throat> putting many things together, um, you have had many roles throughout your career yeah. as a studio artist, obviously, as a teacher, educator, award-winning educator, mm -hmm. as an administrator, and yep. now more recently <laughs> as a curator. Right. So to someone looking in, <clears throat> You make it seem so doable, and uh, <laughs> like, whoa, do you have role models or strategies that may have helped you find ways to balance all this um, with so many different moving parts? Yeah, well, I think that, that probably everybody in this room plays juggling acts all the time with what they do, right, to be able to have time to make your art or write or curate or whatever it is that you do. There's so many other demands that are going on. Uh, maybe even more so for younger artists, I don't know. But one of the things that's helped me, and this is just a mindset, this is not a tactic necessarily, um, particularly as a university professor, I've tried to see myself as an independent agent yes. rather than just a professor or just a department chair or just an artist or just a family person trying to cook dinner and do whatever there is that needs to be done. Somehow or another, being an independent agent makes me feel like I have more control over how I strategize and come up with the time to make art, rather than saying, okay, now I'm going to shift from this to this or this to that. It's like, this is what I do, and I make those decisions. Now, is that totally true? No. No, there are times when I, you know, as a university professor, I had to do certain things. But I always tried to group it in such a way that I had studio time and see that, for me at least, is the main driving force in what I do. Um, it's something that over time had more and more power for me. It started out, again, as just kind of a game, and it became really more a way of life. So whatever that mindset is that you can come up with, it doesn't have to be independent agent, but something that makes you feel as if you're more in control that's what you need to do, in my opinion. Right. I think we have time for this last question, and it's kind of a continuation of what you've already started mm -hmm. talking about. Sure. So have you ever experienced doubt about your choice to be a fine artist? And if so, how did you or how do you navigate that uncertainty in your practice? And what advice, again, would you have for young artists, and maybe especially for young women artists today? Okay. So... Um, I grew up in a household of uh, really amazing, educated people and liberal and all of that, but they really didn't think that making art was going to be a profession for me, right? Um, I made work, uh, made stuff from the time I was a, a tiny little kid all the way into high school. So when I went to college, I thought, well, maybe I should go for a more academic role or maybe become an attorney like my father, whatever. So I went to Vanderbilt University, which is in Nashville, Tennessee, and 
I, they didn't have a studio major, so I majored in art history because I thought, I can go on and get a doctorate, I can maybe have a more assured way of finding a position. And I loved it. I loved looking at art and thinking about art and writing about art. But I loved doing art more, right? So into my 20s, after I graduated, I taught some. Um, I had a studio on what's now Music Row in Nashville. And again, tried to juggle all of those parts. But when I got to be about 30 years old, I'd had a couple kids, um, and I thought, if I don't go forward into a wider arena now, it's not going to happen. So I applied to the MFA program at UT Knoxville, not that far away from where we were living. And I was accepted, and I went. And it made all the difference in the world for me, because I thought, OK, I'm going to get this MFA, and I'm going to get a university teaching position. Not that that has to be the only goal of an artist, but I needed to make a living, and I thought that would be a good way to do it. Um, all the faculty at first said, there's no chance. There are no jobs. <laughs> it's too tough out there. But that made me go even stronger and use my time more strategically. And I was very fortunate and very lucky to get a teaching position right out of college, right out of the MFA program. Uh, lots of support to do that. So having that goal made a big difference to me. Um, and trying again to juggle things in such a way so that I could do what I needed to do. I had another image of, in my mind of a light switch. That if I only had 30 minutes each day, or 30 minutes in the morning, or 45 minutes in the afternoon, it's rather than waiting to be inspired, I like mentally turned that light switch on and went to the studio and did my work, whatever that was. If I got a lot done, great. If I didn't, that's OK, too. I used every time and moment that I had. And that's really helped me over the years. So I don't com didn't complain too much about you know too many family responsibilities or eventually too many university committees, because there always are. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah. sort of just like a tip of the iceberg of what I wanted to talk with you about today, but our time is up. So Absolutely. I want to thank you very much for sharing that with us today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so our next um, pair of speakers is going to be Christy Dietz, who is a professor of art from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Green Bay, and I'm going to let her introduce Phyllis to you. Phyllis Bramson visited my graduate painting studio in the 1980s. Having had a few women teachers, I was immediately impressed with her calm, confident, positive demeanor and directness. She asked challenging and thoughtful questions that set me on new paths of discovery. Since that time, I have followed Phyllis's career and artwork with fascination and admiration. She continues to send me catalogs or images of her work that I share with my students or include in professional presentations. Phyllis Bramson has received many significant awards, including three National Endowments for the Arts, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a Rockefeller Foundation grant. Her amazing paintings are on display in prestigious museums and collections and have been featured in over 40 one-person exhibitions including a mid-career survey at the Renaissance Society, University of Chicago, and a 30-year retrospective at the Rockford Art Museum that traveled to the Chicago Cultural Center in 2016. So for my first question. <laughs> you are currently advising graduate students at SAIC after retiring from the University of Illinois Chicago in 2007. Um, will you please talk about your approaches as a teacher, what you enjoy about teaching, and why it remains interesting and fruitful? Well, um, first I have to talk about the University of Illinois at, in Chicago, uh, which um, has a painting program, a, a good graduate program, but uh, it didn't really like painting all that much. <laughs> so when I got there, I had to work on that. And it was really a very important time in my life because I went uh, to school at a time 
when nobody was talking about anything. That, that was really like in the 60s and 70s. Um, so, uh, and also painting had sort of diminished. So that became like a mission. And when I went over to uh, the School of the Art Institute, I had already um, retired, but I really liked teaching. I think I have a skill for bringing out the best in students or understanding who they are. I don't like people that teach, as I'm kind of wording it sort of in a terribly negative way. I don't, I, I think it's very important to try to figure out what the student wants, who they are, what they're good at, and I have, <laughs> periodically said to someone, you're not a painter, uh, you're a photographer or you're a writer, I don't think you should pursue painting anymore. And that's been thrown back at me by people who became writers or curators uh, because painting isn't real, and you know, painting is a kind of an, in an idealized state, but it's actually very, di very difficult to do. So um, I think I've answered your question. <laughs> I'm not sure. No, that was great. That was great. Um, someone might describe your paintings as floating, ornate worlds with secretive, seductive narratives that integrate visual patterns evoking both dark and light. How do you go about the process of subverting meaning? Well, part of it is, um, I don't exactly have <laughs> a notion of its meaning. Um, I mean, I understand uh, what I'm operating from. The painting up above, you know, does take chances. I think I'm sort of a subverter, uh, but, I've, but I do that even in teaching. I'm, I'm subversive in faculty meetings and <laughs> with, you know, teaching differently. I think that's just part of my nature. Um, so in a painting like this, um, this is one of those paintings that just sort of popped out. And um, I deal with uh, uh, found paintings. I go to a painting warehouse where there's, you know, hundreds of paintings. They could be, there could be um, paintings that go from small to middle to large, painted identically. It's just bizarre. So um, I had found this Buddha, and um, which I, you know, adjusted, did a lot of things to. And I, uh, so there's a lot of other found paintings in here, and they just, I don't know, it just all c came together. Um, recognizing that, you know, I'm, I'm playing in a dangerous place, which I call Orientalism because that is a word, uh, it's an art historical word. I, I don't like the way um, things have turned where you can't paint if you're not that person from that gender, that this, that, that. This is becoming to me uh, a very um, difficult scene that's be, that reflects the culture that we're in, where, where we are. It's a lot of judgment, what you can do, what you can't do. And um, it probably happens at uh, painting programs too at this point. Um, so the idea of meaning is more that I like, I like the notion of being transgressive. It's not uh, I don't think it's mean-spirited. I sometimes deal with not pornography, but sexuality. Uh, I've been censored about that at various times. It's very gentle, very humorous, but very loving. But the bottom line is, is it a good painting? That's, that's the thing. Is, and is it beautiful? Were great answers. <laughs> On social media, you note that you enjoy lists of life lessons and empowerment advice. 
What advice do you offer the current generation of women artist teachers? Women artists, um, women, women artist teachers or students? Women artists slash teachers. And students. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> there is a woman named uh, Molly Zuckerman Hartig. And I was looking her up and I found on, maybe it was her Instagram, this statement, which I think is great. Art is a prison and I'm serving a lifetime sentence. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so that's the first thing that I, I talk. Uh, I'm really going to talk more about just fellow artists and students because um, I have witnessed uh, the fact that there are, I call them sinkholes, where uh, it could be a life situation, a failure in terms of a career situation, a perceived failure, um, bitterness, um, why, am they, why is that person getting that and I'm not? These are really significant things. Um, I think, um, well, I have somebody who helps me on Saturdays and um, I've been mentioning her and increasingly she is moving ahead. She's kind of on fire and she is like, I want it, I want it, I want it. I'm at that point where, can I get it, can I get it, can I get it? And so I kind of refer to her as um, she's on fire and I'm just a pot boiling, trying to cook something in it. <laughs> because I, I think that if you um, are really serious, eventually something will happen that is of significance, that gives you some sense of status. I mean, you have to, you have to be there for it. You have to have your studio ready for visits. You have to act as if you've got a really good career and that you're building up this body of work. Um, but in the, real, in the reality of it, some people will get more than you will get. And that's just the facts. It could be the timing. Uh, you may not, uh, your best work or when you're most able might be uh, the time when your work isn't really of significance. And then when it is, um, it, that, that there may be a situation in which you can't deal with it. I'm just saying that timing is part of it. Optimism is part of it. Grit, that's so important. And I think as one uh, gets older, uh, those things are part of what I call the sinkhole. Um, so there are so many ways in which you can prevent yourself from doing your work. And I think, um, as, as you said, um, I think you just, you, you really have to love doing it. But as I said, it's a prison. <laughs> and, and the thing is, you don't retire. And uh, the most aggravating thing I'm dealing with now are people of my age and you know, not, um, not artists. And they'll say, are, are you retired? Are you still painting? That, I love that one. Are you still painting? And I'll say, yeah, I am still painting. I mean, and, and you know, and I, I, can't, I can't control sort of a little bit of anger about it. Um, why, 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 why haven't you retired? And I'll say, because artists don't retire. I have a commitment. I have a commitment to myself. I have a commitment to people who are interested in me. And I just, it's not going to stop. The only thing that's going to stop is something so terrible. You know, maybe my hands are going to fall off or something. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them floating in your yeah, brain. Right. Right. <laughs> oh, geez. Well, we'll switch back to your artwork um, just briefly. Uh, what do your paintings ask of the viewer? Well, you know, uh, I often think of my work as love and affection in a troubled wor world. 
I guess I asked the viewer to find the work interesting, compelling, quirky, maybe troubled. I, I really want them to like the paintings and, and to think of them as being beautiful. I mean, I work uh, as hard as I can about that. Understanding that there might be something that's pushing them away at the same time. So um, I could say that my work looks back uh, uh, with troubled splendor. Looks back at the audience. I'll have to write them down. <laughs> <laughs> you recently organized and curated what came after figurative painting in Chicago, 1978 to 1998 at the Elmhurst Art Museum as a way to bring attention to artists from the Chicago School or post-imagists. Would you explain your intellectual and aesthetic connection to these painters? This is a really great catalog, too, from the show. Uh, <laughs> Chicago, uh, if, if any of you know Chicago, you're going to probably think about the Harry Who. That's Chicago. Chicago th thinks about the Harry Who as well. Uh, and the Harry Who uh, is a group of artists that are terrific. Uh, they use pop and surrealism. Uh, they have a particular style and a way of thinking. They have definitely influenced Chicago artists. They've probably influenced me. Then you have the images, uh, which uh, that starts to confuse things because the Harry Who are the Harry Who, the images could include anybody that does a figure and it has some kind of narration. And as the Harry Who recently began to get more and more attention, I just, I just was getting really annoyed. So I, um, I, knew, I knew about this period from essentially 1978 to 1998 of cohorts they're very interesting painters. They're powerful. But it's not that they haven't done well individually, but nobody's ever talk and, talked about them. Nobody's ever linked them together as a group, partly because uh, there was that downturn, just as the artists might have uh, begun to have some attention. The galleries that they were in closed. Um, there, there are just various things. There was a big book that was written recently about a Chicago after the fire. Nothing about, I mean, I, I and other people from the show were in that book, but we were never talked about as this group of people. So this goes back to what um, Virginia was saying, and that's um, you start doing stuff on your own, and you were saying that too. If you don't like something, you don't, and you think you should be a part of it, you do this, and there was a period of time when I think that, we, uh, that there was more active aspects of that. Um, so that's what I did. I just I shopped the show, I organized it, I had the people in mind. There was only one terrible thing that happened, and there's this wonderful curator, art historian, critic, Jim Yud, who uh, died. Right as, and he, he was going to do it with me. He died. And he was also a, a tremendous supporter of that period. So that was, you know, something I just had to say, oh, well, okay. Uh, I, I hate this. This is terrible. But I proceeded. Uh, and actually the ca catalog and the show are in honor of him. Yeah. And on the co cover is Hollis Sigler, who some of you may know of her work. One more question? Okay. <laughs> this is the last question. Um, has your desi desire to make work changed over the years? No, it hasn't changed uh, at all. Um, it's just become harder. Uh, because I think, again, as you get older, uh, you've been there, done that. So I think the fire uh, is definitely, I mean, it's there, but it's just, hard, it's just harder. 
And so it's been interesting. This is the second lecture I've heard in two days where uh, someone said that they're looking at their older work and they're, um, they're reviving it. And uh, that's exactly what I've decided I'm going to do. I, I've done one painting so far. It's really different from when it was, uh, I think, 10 or 15 years ago. And I don't think it's as good. <laughs> so that's, the st uh, actually, that's the st struggle that I'm working with is, I don't think I'm quite as good as I was. And what am I, you know, what do I do about this? Because uh, I think the first viewer is yourself. And that viewer can be dangerous as well because it can say, not good, not good, not good, not good. I have this running joke with myself because I do use a lot of collaging when I first start out and something will fall off and I'll say, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay. So our next um, pair are Joan Baru and Miriam Shear. Joan, as I said earlier, is a professor at Columbia College Chicago, and she's the current um, chair of the Services to Artists Committee, and um, she's going to take care of the introductions from them. Hi, I'm Joan Giroux. I'm a professor here in Columbia College Chicago's Art and Art History Department and also the current chair of CAA Services to Artists Committee. And I met Miriam Scher, who I call Mimi, uh, in 2004 when we both participated in a series of professional development strategic planning sessions run by Creative Capital at Newark's Algiera Art Center in New Jersey. And then years later, I was delighted to learn that Mimi would be my colleague at Columbia College Chicago, albeit in a different department. Miriam Scher's career is expansive with interdisciplinary work straddling book arts, object making, installation, photography, and printmaking. Miriam has exhibited in the United States and internationally, most recently in Art in Odd Places in New York City. Her work has been supported with grants through the Fulbright Foundation, the Soros Foundation, New York Foundation for the Arts, and through residencies in Egypt, India, and the Republic of Georgia. The invitation to interview Mimi today gave me a wonderful opportunity to learn more about her work and her career, a thoroughly rewarding experience. So my first question um, is, for more than a decade, you've been working on several interconnected bodies of work that reveal and express experiences of loss, your own losses and those of others. In Babies Not On Board, The Last Prejudice, and later The, the Presence of Their Absence, The Portraits, you address the loss of opportunity for you to have and raise a child and the loss of your expectation of motherhood. And then later in Memory Fading, you juxtapose images of a robe and your own mother's face to portray the anticipated loss of your mother's death. Can you talk a little bit about loss and about imaging loss and how you image loss? Um, it's something, you know, when we were having this conversation, it, I started to think about th this theme, and it actually went back much further than I realized. Um, a lot of times the work I make is in search of questions that really have no answers. And I know they have no answers, but I'm trying to figure it out and sort it out and process it. So, I mean, one of the very first things I thought when my father died in 1998, a friend of mine said, oh, this is going to have a profound effect on your work. And I was like, really? Oh, I don't think so. And then, exactly. You know, I was an idiot. I thought, oh, I've got that all worked out. Not at all. And uh, it was funny. Phyllis said something about how a painting just sort of happened out of her. And I made a small book out of my father's letters. He would write to me weekly, but it was essentially the same letter over and over again. Um, just a short note to say everything is okay, then there'd be a weather report, then there'd be something about my, one of my siblings or what my sister or my brother, what they were doing, um, and it was the same letter on legal paper. He was a doctor, but he always wrote on legal paper. And something took over, and I just ended up making this piece out of his letters, and it was called Memory of Missing Words. And then I made several other pieces about mourning and the mourning process. Um, 
So I think a lot of times we're just trying to process things and figuring out how to make sense of them um, when they don't make any sense really at all. So as a follow-up to this question about loss, can you talk about whether these themes of loss and absence you've engaged with so profoundly since 2007 have been part of your art making practice since you were a young artist, like vi revisiting old work, like is this part of your older work and um, how does it relate to your early work and what threads can you identify as being present since you did make, begin yeah. making work? Well, one of the things that was really interesting to me is I started in fiber in the 70s. And if you look at my work, it makes sense. And then at the end, my very last semester, I went to, it states me, PCA, which Philadelphia College of Art, it's now University of the Arts. Um, I took a book class. And it, the guy who taught it really didn't know what he was doing. But it completely spoke to me. And then I moved to New York, and I found the Center for Book Arts. And you know, it was the perfect solution. I had, a, at the time, a teeny studio apartment. I was able to make things that could fold up, but I could make things that were big as well, and then they would fold down. Um, and then I started incorporating some of my, my life skills, because we always made things growing up. We made doorknobs, we made clothes, we made all sorts of things. And I found that in 2003, I got NIFA. And in NIFA, um, NIFA is New York Foundation for the Arts Visual Fellowship, and a lot of states have them, but it's a fellowship, so it's unrestricted funds to do whatever you want. It's not a project grant to support your art. And I had uh, friends that were living in India at the time, working for the State Department, and I went to India with my NIFA money. And what that did is it totally connected me back into fibers. It made me understand what got me excited about art. And it was that materiality, the sensual, I mean, it's so seductive. The materials are so beautiful and the colors. And I think because I did that, then I was able to do the embroidery pieces from Babies Not On Board. And from that, that became a really interesting arc. Um, I brought the two books that came out of that research. And you can look at them. I'll you know, pass them around if you want later. But I first embroidered all these garments with critical comments about childlessness and not, or child-free, however you want to approach it. And then I, I was like, well, now what? You know, and then there was a whole big conversation. Well, I didn't want to put them on real, actual babies. You run into some interesting ethical problems there. <laughs> um, and then I discovered the reborn babies, and then, you know, you make the art you need to make and you learn what you need to do to get it done. And I figured out either by collaborating with a photographer um, or just figuring out how to do the photography myself, started to dress the dolls in these reborn babies. So that is what is in this picture and in this picture here. And the thing that's amazing is that they photograph very lifelike. So it really looks like these babies are flying across the playground. Um, I then showed, so I dressed the dolls in the garments, I photographed them, made a portfolio. Because I'm always very book focused, I made portfolios and houses and groups for those uh, images. And then I showed the images on the computer to my mom, who was in dementia, she was living with my sister in the northwest suburbs, and she went crazy for the dolls, for the babies. My mother had been a maternity nurse. She had four children. She loved babies, kids she was a little more ambivalent about. Um, well, you know, they say no. They give you a hard time. <laughs> babies, she could do anything with any baby. And so she took care of the babies, and she went crazy. So I got her a doll. And then I feel really fortunate that I was able to do this large body of work, photographing her with her. And then I used those materials to do a series of collages, um, installations, at, that was the natural arc of the first project. And then, um, you know, you think you're done with something, but it's not done with you. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of actually leads That's in because you were talking stopped. about the, um, you know, your mom and um, I, 
we had not spoken about the piece that you did um, with your we, with your dad's letters, which is interesting. It relates to this question too. Um, we had met in that wonderful cafe in Brooklyn a few months ago, and you showed me the beginning of a series that you were working on related to your mother's notebooks and what you called the word salad that she recorded in the late stages of dementia. Can you walk us through that a little bit, describe the work, and talk about your process in approaching it? Um, about, I know, it was a number of months, maybe even a year after she died, my sister handed me a notebook. And she's like, I think you're going to want this. And what it was was this writing that my mom had done. Sometimes there were caregivers' handwriting in there where there, she's trying to replicate that. She's trying to figure out what she wants and who she was. There were a number of her obsessions because a lot of times, even when you're in dementia, you're still who you are. And she was. And I'm grateful she always knew who I was. I mean, there's stuff about her weight. She was completely obsessed with weight and body image. Um, that's a whole other body of work we could go into. But, um, and she was a woman of her generation. I mean, she would you know, put her makeup on to take the trash out. I mean, always very concerned about you know, her appearances. But um, so I scanned the pages of the notebook into my computer. I photoshopped them to silhouette them. And then I've printed them out on a, kind of a five millimeter Habotai silk. And I'm in the process of backing them with, um, with a cotton backing. And I'm going to start to embroider some of the words. And I've made models of the structures I'm going to do. Um, a couple people have seen it so far, thought that some of those quilted pieces could possibly be an installation. It's so, this is one of the hardest things. Like, I have to do it. You're, someone was talking about, like, what makes you work. I mean, it's like, I don't know. It just sort of chooses you, and you have to do it. And then sometimes you go on these wild detours that you don't even know what sense they make in terms of the work you're ending up making. Um, in 96, I think, I got a crossing over uh, fellowship and I went to Spain as a part of Crossing Over Changing Places. It was the first time I'd ever traveled internationally for my work or worked. And for reasons I'll never understand, I got sent to Spain. And I came back and I was like, I need to learn Spanish. I don't know why. And I really spent a lot of time <laughs> learning Spanish. And I'm very mediocre and people are kind. But <laughs> I had to do it. It was something I had to do. And I it informed my art in some kind of weird way. This is a similar kind of thing. Like, so I'm, I'm working on it, but it's so loaded and so hard that I go, it, it's taking a really long time. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so <clears throat> in addition to bringing your mother and her story and your relationship to her and things about her into, into your work, you've also photographed your sister in that context within the family um, as we see in the image that she's in the background. Um, so, so your work has kind of investigated the narratives of people in your family, and I'm curious as to how your family responds to this very intimate work going out into the public. It's, like, how do they it, It's really feel interesting. About I, uh, my sister, who is here today, yay, oh, is very, I wanted to introduce you, she's over there. Hi, <laughs> hi Mimi's sister. Susan. Um, anyhow, um, she's very supportive. And you know, and my nieces are also very supportive. Um, it's interesting. I actually don't know what David thinks. He's never said anything to me. He's an engineer. He's very kind of by the book. Hmm, how is it made? Blah blah blah. I mean, he got very excited about my board shares because it's real industry, and they're like, you know, he went on and on about the board shares when I got my board shares at my studio. My brother Jonathan, who's a journalist, uh, he's a cameraman for CNN. He completely freaks out. And he's never, what thing's interesting to me, though, is he's never said anything to me. He calls Susie <laughs> and, and talks to her. Yeah, he talks to her about how upset he is that that work is going out in the public. Once I wrote, and yeah, yeah. once I had one of the very first writing journeys, because I mean, it's one of the things that surprised me a lot as an artist is how much writing you have to do. And I took a uh, writing for artists workshop with the late, great Arlene Raven in New York. Oh, I was just writing ready, thinking I should do it again. And then she passed away, sadly, too early from cancer. But she, um, 
I started writing and writing and writing, and he saw it somehow, and I talked a lot about, I mean, there are some family stories that we know, and I do know, I, um, my great-grandfather on my mother's side was thrown in jail for, he was trained as a jeweler, but he was thrown in jail for being a jewel thief, and I just wrote them as I, like all these stories because we used to sit around the kitchen table drinking tea, and my mom and her best friend Eleanor would tell stories about the family as much as they knew, and that was really profound. But I know that it upsets him greatly, mm -hmm. but it's really interesting that he really doesn't talk to me about it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure many families don't talk to the artists about lots of the things. They're the intermediaries yeah. that yeah. we do. Um, so that's that was actually also a good segue because the, the last question that I have is um, about your writing because in addition to your art practice, you also write and you find inspiration in text. Uh, for example, in your essay, The Motherhood Imperative, Fertility, Feminism, Art, you refer to Allen Ginsberg's poem, Kaddish? Kaddish? Kaddish. Kaddish. Can you talk about this, these inspirations? Like, how does your writing inform your art practice and vice versa? And are there always positive reciprocities between these activities, or do they sometimes sort of jar against each other in a challenging way that sort of keeps you from the work? I think writing is so hard. Um, I live with a writer and editor who has encouraged me. It blows me away when I think about it. Um, he's a poet, he's a writer, he's also an incredible editor. And he pushes me and makes me rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Um, that essay that is coming out, or just was published by Rutledge, is in a collection. Um, and I was a little sick at the time, and I knew I'd need time. I start, It was due in November. I started in July. I figured we're going to have to do at least two or three revisions, and we ended up doing seven. Ooh. Um, and it came back without any changes, which I was, and amazing notes from the readers, mm -hmm. which really was very moving. Um, it's really hard. And I feel like, oh, I'm not, when I do it, I think, it's not like making art. Even when my art, making art is hard, there's a fun aspect to it. You're playing, you use materials, even if you go on a tangent. Writing is hard. Um, it has been really informative, and I always say I'm not going to do it, and then people keep coming to me with writing projects I can't turn down. Um, one is that's coming up soon is a conversation I'm going to be having, and we're going to do it in the form of a conversation, just like this, with an artist named Susie Banks Baum, who's been making books with women's groups in Armenia, and we're going to talk about the experience her experience as it, and, and my experience with the book project I did with Melissa Potter and Cliff Matter in the Republic of Georgia, working with women's groups making books from felt. So I was like, oh my God, this is coming back. And I, you know, it's writing I find really hard. The Kaddish was really interesting because that was pointed out to me. And Kaddish is Allen Ginsberg's poem about his mother who was institutionalized. And it became the title, a line from that poem became a title of that series of photographs called The Key is in the Window. And I had made a key-shaped box with a keyhole that opened up and they fit inside. So you almost had to pry the book open with these multiple shapes and layers. And I kind of like that when the book becomes a little bit performative. Mm -hmm. Because it is, even if you're doing it yourself, there's a private performance of opening, closing, if there are pages in it that unfurl out. It can be a part of the process of experiencing the book on multiple levels, not just reading, but handling it and feeling the pages. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank so you. thank you so much. Yeah. Well, I actually, I want to actually say something about something that Phyllis said. Is that okay? So, um, in the Whitney Biennial a couple of years ago, when there was the big, um, I'm really glad that you said what you said about the current culture and how if you're not a thing, uh, if you're not a particular individual, belong to a particular group of individuals, you should not be able to represent those individuals. Because when the, um, was it Dana Schutz, was that her name? When the, <laughs> my, my guy, who is a 
um, Unitarian Universalist secular Jew from the East Coast pointed out to me when I was showing him the controversy about Dana Schutz thing and you know how can white people pr um, image the suffering of black people, he said, well, then the Christians better get rid of all of those Jesus hanging in their churches because that's the Christians portraying the suffering of a Jew. And, you know, so that, that's fair game. So I, I, and I do have difficulties with this idea that we cannot put ourselves in other shoes or perceive through other eyes. So I just wanted to thank you for your interpretation and sort of take on that. Yeah, and it, 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 it really, uh, really hurt her up. Uh, I mean, because not only was there that censorship, but they, there were groups of people they didn't want her to show anywhere. And um, her work has always been difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I really don't think she knew what, what that this was going to happen. It didn't occur to her. Um, maybe that was being a little naive, but, um, and I don't, I think, I, I think the Whitney did support her, but I think the w worst thing was that people wanted to destroy her. I mean, that's, in the art world, that's a fellow artist, doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I, I'm from the UK, I teach architecture at Trinity St. David in Swansea. And in architecture land, what happens when you start off is that you, you're often your first commission is you do the house for your parents or your house for your uncle or that kind of thing to test your ideas. So Miriam did t touch on this a bit, but I was asking, uh, my question really is that how, how do you, have you uh, tested your ideas, as in your art development ideas, on your family, you know, in your formative years and also when you're sort of starting to develop which media you're going to go with? Did everybody hear that? Do you want to repeat the yeah. question? Um, it, it was in part how um, we as artists sort of tested out our di ideas in our formative years with family in some way. Is that kind of pretty good synopsis? So um, real briefly, I, I was saying that I grew up in a household that didn't necessarily see art as a profession or something to do other than just a hobby. However, um, one of the things that I remember, a, a pivotal moment for me, uh, I must have been about 10 or 11 years old, my father bought this huge set of Rembrandt pastels, which are not cheap, yeah. for me to use any way I wanted to. And it made a huge difference for me from the get-go. So is that, that's not exactly what you were asking, but I wanted to. All right, thank you. Do you have a pivotal moment, Phyllis, from your early years? Well, I won a lot of um, <laughs> awards in sixth grade, <laughs> and and I, I didn't really. I it's not exactly a pivotal moment. I just nothing else was of interest. You know, I mean. I didn't have a choice. I wasn't good at anything else. I wasn't interested in anything else. And I had, um, you know, <laughs> I had a ter terrible art teachers and um, all, you know. <laughs> and I remember everything they said. That's what's so bizarre, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, I think that pivotal moment, that's an in interesting thing. I think when, uh, Sometimes it's it's not a pivotal moment. It's just you don't have a choice. Um, well, I'm from a family where people made things, but my parents were both Depression era children. Hmm. So you know, my mother's mantra is, "What are you going to do to make a living? I'm not raising any bums." <laughs> and you know, that was a huge concern. So I think for the way I worked that out, because there were no artists in my family, um, except my grandmother painted, but no one really took that, that seriously. Um, I said, okay, I'm gonna be a textile designer without really knowing what that meant, but it seemed like a profession. And um, what I didn't know is 
you know, and then I went to art school in Philadelphia and moved to New York. And what I didn't realize is that, yeah, it's a profession. And if you want to do that, you should really go to FIT because you're competing with all those people. I did a little bit of textile work. Um, uh, my mother's parameters, though, for um, if art was good, was was it neat? Because she was a nurse, and she would like look at things and say, it's, it's really messy. I don't know if I really like it. Um, and, you know, so I, and I don't know why, like, I just ignored all of that. Um, and then all of a sudden, she was like, oh, wait, you're making things that, it took her a long time to sort of come along. And then she was very, very supportive. Um, but I think the whole thing about being an artist was so terrifying to her from her background. And I think a lot of times for family members, it is, it's a really frightening thing because it, it's yeah. hard to grab your head around. You know, you're, um, this is not gonna, this is not gonna sound good, uh, but your pivotal moment was actually move, move, moving to New York. Oh, and that's that was a pivotal moment uh, because it is more difficult if you don't live in New York in some ways. You might not get the attention. There might not be the opportunity. It's easier not to live in New York. But I'll always wonder, if I had moved to New York, what would be happening at this very moment? Uh, because there are, uh, the networking there is very good. People are pretty generous in New York, I have found, because everyone knows how hard it is. And I know I've had a lot of opportunities because I've been there. Um, and I've been there a long time now. I've been there since 78. Um, including the seven years I commuted from New York to Chicago to teach at Columbia College, Chicago. Um, yeah, it, it's actually been amazing for me, and I know it's because I've been there, and, I, and, and there is community there, and that's, that's been really an interesting uh, journey. And also, I, it's, I really wanted to go to New York for art school, but my parents wouldn't let me go. New York in the 70s was a very different place. Um, and as soon as I could go, I went. And I grew up in Buffalo, and my earliest thoughts were, I need to be somewhere bigger. Like, I need to not be the weirdo all the time. Okay. When many of you were students, there were fewer female mentors. Um, talk about those people who were your mentors. Um, actually, one of my mentors at UT Knoxville was Marsha Goldenstein, um, who is now a colleague and we're showing together, you know, life is strange. Um, and she was, in many ways, extremely generous, a real cheerleader for me when I was in the MFA program and continued to do that throughout my life. Um, and one other thing, and it reminds me of what you were me, segue. Um, the generosity of other artists. You think they're not, but they really and truly are. Uh, I went on a bus trip, but before I went to my MFA program, a bus trip organized by the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and I met Sam Yates, who's the gallery director there. And on the way up to New York, he said, I'm going to be having dinner with Alice Neal. And I went, oh, God, please take me to. <laughs> so... <laughs> So he did. Four or five students who were on the trip went to have dinner with her, and she was amazing. She was in her early 80s, but she talked about each of our faces and how she would do a portrait of us or could or how. And then after dinner, uh, she invited us to her studio across the street, which is also where she lived. And that, again, warmth and generosity and support was a huge push forward for me. So a mentor, not exactly, but yeah. Yes. My, my mentor was Ellen Lanyon, um, who, uh, I don't know, I was trying to figure it out, maybe it was 15 years older than me or more. And um, <clears throat> she also, incredibly generous. Um, she was the kind of a person who curated her friends. Um, I know that, and I, you know, I always, always thought, how how did I get to be a friend of Ellen Lanyon's? Um, 
I think it's be I think it's because we were both straight shooters, and uh, I I trusted her uh, com completely. And the thing that got really interesting is, eventually those maybe 18 years or so uh, got to be more extreme, and um, I found her you know a little odd <laughs> as we got older, uh, just like. Uh, I'm sure the woman that works for me finds me a little odd at this point. I actually n don't really feel like I had any mentors at all in art school. Um, it was kind of a nightmare. Um, when I asked the head of my program for a letter for graduate school, he said no. Oh, wow. Right. And that was devastating. Um, and I then I, I moved to New York. Um, yeah, it, it, it's really weird. I, I made my own little weird program. I went to the Center for Book Arts. Um, I discovered Tim Ely, who is an amazing book artist. And he was one of the first people that gave me uh, the space to be myself. And I started to understand and get the skills that I needed to make the work that I had always seen in my mind's eye. Um, and from there, I studied with a couple other people, uh, Jeff Peachy, who's more of a conservator. And uh, the other thing that was really formative is for two years, I worked as a volunteer in the bindery at the Metropolitan Museum of Art with Mindy Dubansky, who really gave me free run of the stacks. Hmm. They don't let you do that now. But I really would go through, and, I, and they had a little uh, copy stand, and I made all sorts of slides of historic quirky, unusual book structures. And she'd say, oh, here, look at this. Here's a whole thing on horn books. And horn books are books with paddles, and you put the text in. There's a lot of non-rectangular book structures in the history of book objects. And that's what was really of interest to me. Um, I ended up getting my MFA really late, um, like 2014. <laughs> I did a low residency program because I was uh, teaching in the MFA program here at Columbia. I didn't have an MFA. It was becoming a problem, and uh, as we know. And it actually, I did it for very pragmatic reasons. It turned out to be one of the most pivotal things I ever did. My graduate school advisor is an amazing uh, artist and theoretician Laura Gonzalez, who's based in Glasgow, Scotland. It was a low residency program. We would Skype every month, and then we met in New York for basically crit week. They called it winter residency, and we met for three weeks in Berlin in the summer. And I said, one of the things I said to Laura is that before I experienced that, I had developed all of my teaching in opposition to my personal experience in the educational system. I did not want to teach, and a friend of mine said, oh, you need to teach me, me. And then he got me an artist in the schools gig. And I said, well, now what do I do? And I went over, and he, we had lunch, we cleared the table, and then we sat around making little books. That was how I started teaching. I did artists in schools, and I taught workshops, and then I got an adjunct gig at Pratt, and I was doing visiting artist places, and then one thing led to another. Um, but after working with Laura Gonzalez in the program at TransArt, I had to rethink my entire approach to education because it was somebody who turned my feelings upside down about that. And that was really interesting and something that I didn't expect. I had always hoped for a mentor, but it, you know, I sort of pieced them together in funny ways. And I mean, art school in the 70s was a different place. Okay, um, the question was to really think about the labor that goes into the work as a part of the process, or is it a statement about feminism? 
And I think, you know, all of the above. I mean, I think, you know, a couple people years ago, I did a series of embroidered aprons where I transfer printed images of idealized women from my childhood to the 60s from my McCall's collection of McCall's fashion. And I embroidered them with quotes from Sun Tzu, The Art of War, taking war theory and putting it into a domestic context. And a number of people had said, oh, you should like job these out and, you know, have women in Guatemala e embroider them. And I was like, no, I should not. I need to do that. Um, and it was an important part of the process. The other thing too for me, and you know, I'm sort of interested in machine embroidery, but the thing when you're doing embroidery is it's so portable. I mean, especially, I mean, one of the things I did, I was really embroidering a lot of those baby garments when I was commuting back and forth between New York and Chicago. And the other, the part of that that was so interesting is the kind of conversations it would spark with people who were just happened to be sitting next to you on the plane. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really interesting and it became a part of the process as well. Everything I do seems to be labor intensive even when I don't really want it to be. It's just, it's something about me as well. I can't really say it started out being a uh, intellectual feminist pursuit. It's just kind of the way it works. Everything takes more time than you think. So uh, and to building on that just a, a little bit, um, all the embroidery and stitching I do is hand done as well. And again, for all of the above reasons. But one of the things, again, that I hope happens is that that slow process is translated into slow looking from the viewer. That there's that sense of uh, a time, a moment, uh, quirkiness, whatever it is, that attracts people to look more closely, not just from a distance, that back and forth. Same thing about painting, too, in a way. But there's that that connection. Good question. In your pieces that are object based and postal, do you have sewing and stitching in those pieces? I can't quite remember. No, no. I <clears throat> I don't. Um, if I were, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> okay. I'd have somebody else do it. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, I I was just mulling over. The idea, again, a little controversial, about, I mean, I too had, uh, in graduate school, I had a faculty member, a male faculty member say to me, um, I don't know why I'm bothering with you, because you're just going to get married and have kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so, yeah. But, you know, um, and I know I, that, that kind of stuff just doesn't exist. I really don't think it exists anymore. And so, I don't think it's obvious. Why don't we ask some of the yeah. students? You know, I, th I, don't think a, it, I don't think it's as blatant. Exist. It does exist, yes, still today, yeah. Well, then you should just ignore it. <laughs> you, use it as fire, you know, yeah, exactly. uh, you you know ingredients well, to burn. Yeah. You know, She's been next to her. My question uh, was about the uh, importance of geographic location for artists and educators. Uh, sounds like you believe in the larger cities. Uh, maybe that will give artists and educators to have more satisfaction of their career, maybe. Um, so do you have any advice for people who are outside of New York or Chicago or larger cities in the United States? Well, uh, I just think it's just, you, you just have to acknowledge it, there's a difference. I mean, even Chicago is not, you know, it's Los Angeles, New York. That's where a lot of curators and critics go back and forth. In a way, it's just, it's, it is what it is, and I think you just have to acknowledge that there's a di there will be a difference. It doesn't mean that you can't get satisfaction within the community. It's just an acknowledgement of it. Is the, and, and also, I always say to students, you, not everybody gets to go to Yale, you know what I mean? So that people who go to Yale support each other big time. There's a lot of... Uh, you know, interchange 
but you don't all get to go to Yale. I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign and the University of Wisconsin. And somewhat for the same reason, my parents would not let me go to New York and they would not let me go to Chicago. Now, is that their fault? No, I think it was my fault. I blame me, I don't blame them. I mean, they didn't want it, but if I'd had enough guts, I would have just said, well, that's where I'm going. Um, I hope you'll still support me, but you know, and I, and I really I sort of said, okay, I, you know, I want to please you. So, and I survived, is I guess what I'm saying. Um, I, it's been a big challenge for me because I've mostly lived in small towns and um, small uni you know, university towns and so on. But what I've found is that it's caused me to be more working for myself and going to make connections and even though I'm a, a fairly introverted person to get my work out there and connect and one of the best pieces of advice I ever had was let writers who write about art critics museum curators that's their job is to learn about new art and you need to get out there and show them your work and so I've taken that strategy and it's one it's done pretty well for me um, I, my first teaching position was at West Virginia University, which is Morgantown, West Virginia. Not exactly the middle of nowhere, but kind of, anyway. Uh, and, but I got to know other artists in uh, Pittsburgh, which is also not a huge town, but the Carnegie Museum is there. And so I was curated into an exhibition, a juried exhibition in West Virginia, and one of the uh, jurors was John Caldwell, who was the curator of the, at the Carnegie. And someone told me, well, he really does look at slides at that time of new work. And eventually, if he's interested, he'll get in touch with you. So I made that attempt. And it took about six months. But then he said, come and bring some work with you to the Carnegie, and let's have a conversation. And so I brought all these drawings and things that I'd been working on and laid them out on the floor of his office. And he said, I think we're going to buy one today. Wow. And they did. That's so great. that's the kind of thing that I've needed to do. But again, it's the energy of the work and the commitment to it that counts in the long run, not the short run, but the long run. That's well, what we thought. I think it goes back, if I may say something, yeah. <laughs> to what you were talking about in terms of community. Yeah. You can establish that sense of community wherever you right. are if you work in it. Right. And uh, Christie's in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Visited. I thought I was at the end of the world. <laughs> I was in the South as well, and you find ways to create that community around you sure. that then ripples out into bigger arenas. You join organizations like this one and make connections that cross over the whole country, and you do things yourself. I know the DIY is an old aesthetic, but you know you've got to like just own your practice, own your life. We're not all meant to live in New York City. I would die there. You know, so it, you can succeed wherever you land. Well, and there are pluses and minuses to every situation. Yep. Um, if you're not in New York, you will have more space, except in rare exceptions. I mean, space is really at a premium, and that's a real problem. Um, and the other thing is, the thing that's really interesting to me about now is the invention of that thing they call the Internet. And that has made the interwebs, right, all sorts of connections. Um, I was really, f for me, I've made a ton of connections through my website. Um, in 97, a guy named Jim Whitner set up a website called Colophon Page for artist books. And I don't quite know how he got to me. And I think he was charging I don't know, $300 for 10 images, and I talked to my husband Stan, he said, yeah, sure, why not? And I thought, okay, why not? And I put it on, and I didn't know anything. I took two pages of slides, I took 30 slides, I think, and he had all these uh, people making websites for him. He wasn't actually doing it. The woman he handed my slides to apparently really responded to my work, and she put every single image up. 
And she called me and said, the words are important. We got to get the words here. You got to give me more. So she did this incredible thing. Now, this is 97. So I got so much response from other artists, from several curators. I ended up getting selected to be in a project in Belgrade with artists from Serbia. And we had conversations because of that site, you know. And I think even if you're in a place like New York, you still have to reach out and make community and meet people. Nobody's going to like sit there and knock on your door and say, hi, you're great, let's come. Can I, t I tell you a very funny story? Sure. I had a <laughs> Jim Yud. Uh, he said that, uh, he tells a story. There's this artist, and they're in their studio. And they've got a lot of paintings in their studio. And all of a sudden, there's a car crash and I'm gonna update it. And there's a knock on the door, and it's Jerry Saltz. And Jerry Saltz <laughs> said, I've been in a car crash, I've gotta use your phone. And the phone is in the studio, and he looks around and he said, oh my God, this is some of the best work I've ever seen. I'm going to really do something for you. And Jim Yud's uh, answer was, there's not always going to be that car crash. And there's not always going to be that cherry salt. Sandy Crown, we got his own cell phone. It is time um, to close this down. If anybody has one final question, or we can just say thank you for our lovely you, guests. Do you want to make any comments? I can find you afterwards, but I just wanted to say thank you. Um, this has been inspiring and um, so exciting to hear from all of you, and um, I find that my my students, young folks, have a real block about any of the years that happened before they were born, yes. and <laughs> anything that occurred before they came onto this earth. And so I think that uh, it's great that we're recording this because your words are really important for a younger artist to hear too. So thank you. Well, thank you. I can remind you that all our websites are on the bio sheets. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.